Hi guys, Squall here. Welcome to another episode of This May Contain Nuts. This May Contain Nuts is a series, uh, it's a bit like a Q&A, it's all based on your questions. So you ask the questions and I answer them. Now, the, uh, the theme for today's video is sport. Uh, sport is the suggestion from the last video, so the theme for the questions today will be sport. I'll be answering your questions on the theme of sport for the next episode of this may contain nuts the theme will be toys and that was suggested by that blazing pony his theme suggestion was toys i quite like the sound of that one so all the questions in the next video will have a theme of toys and i need your questions if you want to submit a question uh, on the theme of toys have a look in the video description you'll find a link uh, to a google form you just post your question into that and if you do have another theme suggestion just tack it on the end of your question quite simple enough but I need your questions on the theme of toys for the next video now I'm in a Scania I'm in a Scania um, it's a mod it's a Scania R mod it's in my mod spreadsheet uh, I, I kind of vaguely hesitate to recommend this mod it is interesting as you can tell by the number of axles we've got on this thing and the, the whacking big crane on the back it in many respects it's got some great ideas um, the mod itself in other respects it's a little bit weird for example there's no Scania logo there's no way to put one on there. Uh, some of the accessories uh, are kind of incompatible with each other in that, you know, uh, the air intakes will sit offset to the right there and float in the air, bizarrely. Some of the stuff goes on down the bottom with the mud flaps. Um, you know, you can get them to just clip into each other quite easily. So it's not a perfect mod, but it is a, it is a decent mod. It's got some really nice ideas. I mean, just look at the interior. Look at the interior of this truck. It is... I mean, okay, ignore the low-resolution thingy going on there, the dragon. But look at this, white and black stitched leather. It's an absolutely beautiful uh, uh, interior cabin. We've even got the massive sat-nav down here. And, and this is my personal favourite, up here, uh, we've got this, this display that we can use. You know, it's got the cruise control on the information screen, uh, which you can rotate through with the I key like that. All displayed up here, and then up there a really useful uh, front facing downward camera so you can see how close you are uh, from the front of your truck like I say it's got some great ideas but then you know you look at the skin on this thing and uh, you can see where the stripes are the kind of aliasing effect it's not a very high resolution skin so it's a bit hit and miss but the worst thing is some of the chassis options when I choose them it crashes my game out um, but you know if you don't choose those chassis options you can get a truck like this that looks pretty darn good it comes with a V8 sound mod. I've not got that in use at the moment, though. Uh, but when I do change gear, you get the kind of pneumatic effects going on as well. So, you know, it's in the mod spreadsheet if you want to give it a whirl. It's, like I say, it's a little bit hit and miss. Um, but it's good fun. We're going to be driving this today. Uh, we are in... Let me show you where we are. In Poland. We're in uh, Olsztyn. I think that's how you say it. We're in Olsztyn. And we're going to be driving west through Poland, and we're heading down to Berlin. Our cargo is, so we've got a cargo, 23 tonnes of logs is what we're taking, and we're due to get this there Saturday a.m. So essentially, you know, this is going to be half day, half night uh, kind of a drive. So let's get this thing hooked up. We can get on the road and start answering some questions. Even though this thing's got an enormously long chassis, uh, it does actually have a pretty decent turning capability. That doesn't seem lined up. Let's have a look through that mirror. Possibly a little bit this way. Okay. <laughs> I just broke the truck. Did that actually damage the trailer or the truck, I wonder? It damaged the truck mostly. Okay, that's not too bad then. Hit it a little bit hard. There we go. Alright. We're on the move. Um, we've not got an excessively long vehicle, just a pretty heavy vehicle. 
So we'll skip putting the beacons on. But having driven this truck, I do, I do find um, it is enjoyable. Like I said, the interior is the best thing about this truck. And you'd think with all those chassis, all those axles, sorry, on the chassis, you'd think we'd absorb some of those minor logs a bit better than we do. But I think that's down to the physics, not down to the mod. I love the little Scanny illuminated logo in the front there as well. That looks so nice. I don't know, like I say, it, it is a great... It's a great mod in many respects, but it's just got these major flaws in it. And I hope the author can fix them. Let me stop indicating. Okay. Well... That is pretty confusing. I honestly don't know why that truck just did that, but whatever. <laughs> maybe, maybe they're all slowing down to kind of look at the truck and go, wow, just, just look at that Scania. But isn't the texture a little bit low on the skin? <laughs> but it's a great looking truck. I don't know. I don't know what's going through the mind. Also, like having the sat nav out of view is interesting. You just have to keep glancing down there to check what the speed limit is. But other than that, I do like it. Anyway, let's get on with the first question. So, the theme is sports, and the first question is from Rajan Mystery. And he says, what is your favourite sport? Do you know, I really... I have a strong dislike of questions that say, what is your favourite X, you know? What is your favourite food? What is your favourite drink? What is your favourite this? What is your favourite that? Because I'm a kind of person that doesn't have a favourite in a lot of in a lot of things in life. I do appreciate variety. I'm one of those kind of variety people. I, I guess that's why I play variety of games as well, because I just... As much as I love trucking or flight simming or train simming, you know, I wouldn't want to just pick one and go with it. But in terms of what my favourite sport is, um, I, I don't really play a sport uh, as such. I don't, you know, I don't go playing, for example, football every Sunday um, or anything like that. But in terms of spectating, I, I will spend most of my time watching either snooker or Formula One. Now, snooker is one of those seasonal things for me. Uh, it's not really on the TV very much. It is on at the moment as I'm recording this video because the World Snooker Championships are on, so it's on a lot. Uh, but when it's on, I do try to watch it whenever I can. Uh, Formula One, of course, is uh, is one of those things that is a bit more prevalent on TV and is something I try to watch but often can't keep up with as much as I'd like to and that pretty much goes for most sports. I, I, even TV itself I rarely watch, you know, I, I just don't get time. So I'm not really a spectator in, in that sense, I'm more of a doer. I kind of do things more than have time to sit down and watch things. Uh, so I don't watch a lot of sport, but, you know, snooker and Formula One are the two things that I do enjoy. So I guess that makes them my favourite, but in terms of playing, I don't really play much. Anymore. I used to, but we'll come to that. Okay. I've got the, um... Oh, wow. That coach is actually stopping the... I've got a, uh, a traffic density mod going. I'm just going to take advantage of the fact that the AI is waiting for me to enter this box. Um, bizarrely enough, uh, I've got a traffic density mod, hence why you'll see a lot of traffic. Michael Brown 246 says, What sport were you mainly into when you were young? Ah, that neatly leads on from my previous point. What sports were I mainly into when I was young? Um... The most, the, the things that I used to play the most when I was young was cricket and football. And when I say football, I mean uh, as in what the, you know, the Europeans call football, which to the Americans is soccer. That's, that is what I played primarily. Like, it was very popular in the school playground. We, we, we'd always play matches at lunchtime and um, whenever it wasn't raining, Really enjoyed myself playing that, and cricket was something that, you know, I played um, at school in the summer, 
So I, I really enjoyed playing cricket and I really enjoyed playing football, but I also really started to get into golf and snooker as well. But they were outside of school. Uh, so they were, they were my big four really, snooker, golf, uh, cricket and football. Were, were the main things I played. Let me keep my eye on uh, the direction here. So they were what I played when I was young. Next question is from Joseph. He says, what sport would you like to try? Now, I need to sit down and think about this one. What sport would I like to try? I, I sort of thought to myself, well, you know, I really enjoy motorsports, so the obvious gag is to say, oh, I want to I sit in a Formula 1 car, but... I kind of don't. I'm a six foot three guy. I probably wouldn't even fit into a Formula One car. Um, you know, so I think if I was going to do a motorsport, what I would really love to do is get in a really, a really kind of nice fast car. But what they what they race in is a sport. And the thing that comes to mind would be the Porsche Carrera Cup, because you know Porsche Carreras are well, they're pretty darn fast, and they, they, you know, they handle very well, and they're probably a lot of fun to race. So I imagine that I would want to try a Porsche Carrera uh, around a track. Uh, but in terms of stuff that I'm way too scared to do, but I look at and I think to myself, I would love to try that, but there's no way I ever will. It would be, you know, that like like hang gliding came to mind when I was thinking about this. I don't know if hang gliding is even a sport or not, but hang gliding is kind of, it's getting pretty close to being what it feels like to fly, you know, as a, from a bird's perspective. But then it occurred to me that the ultimate feeling of being a bird is actually that, uh, I think they call it wingsuit gliding. It's where they wear that really bizarre outfit that makes you look like a bat and you kind of put your arms up and uh, you get like a wing between your arm and your body. And essentially, you throw yourself off the top of some uh, mountain, and and you hurtle down. You know, you fly. And sometimes you see videos of people flying really close to rocks and flying through small holes and like crazy stuff. Um, I imagine that is absolutely terrifying. It's it's more or less like throwing yourself out of a plane and and free falling but with a, a bit more degree of control whilst the ground is very close to you. So when you're flying through the air, I don't know what speed they go, probably like 120 miles an hour or something, very close to the ground. Like I say, it's not something I would ever have the courage to do, but I would, I would like to try it. I would like to experience it on a simulator if I could. Like, I know there's a game that lets you, but I don't mean that's not really experience. I mean a kind of proper VR setup where you really get the feeling of flying down the side of a mountain. But there's no way I'll ever do it. There's just no way. But it would be insane to try. So that would be something I would like to do. So the Porsche Carrera Cup and uh, having to go on a wingsuit are the two things that I would, I would list in answer to Joseph's question. Next question is from Hayden D. Uh, Hayden D says... Uh, hello Squirrel, I was wondering, uh, do you have any s funny sports moments, story, sorry, do you have any funny sports stories, and if so, what's your most favourite one? Well, again I had to sit down and think about this one. Uh, I can remember, I can remember being at school, um, primary school as we call it, or elementary school, I think I was about nine possibly eight but probably more like nine uh, going on for ten I remember at that school they wanted us to play rugby a lot we, we was allowed to play football but they also wanted us to try rugby and everybody well not everybody most people didn't want to play rugby I certainly didn't want to play rugby it wasn't my thing at all I hated it in fact I hated playing rugby but I, I had I was unfortunate in many respects I was the tallest person in the class and I was overweight as well so I was this big kind of, you know, almost like a Hodor kind of character, which made me perfectly suited to being in a rugby team. So my teacher would always try and get me to play. Like, he wanted me to like rugby. He wanted me to play. He wanted me as, I think it's prop forward. He wanted me up there just mowing people down. That's what he wanted me to do. But I didn't want to play rugby. Like, I hated it. 
So instead, I would just act like I was rubbish all the time as a sort of protest. And also because I didn't want to be picked to play after school. I didn't want to be picked for a team. So I just, I just act like I was rubbish. But basically one day he just like pulled me to one side and he was like, I know you're good at this. Like, I want you to go out there and I want you to try. I want you to show me what you can do. And some part of me just went, right you, I'll show you what I can do. And I just went out there in kind of not so much full rage mode, but I just put my try hard trousers on and I, I went out there. And um, at one point, I, I, I distinctly remember this. I got the ball, I got past the ball, right? So I'm holding this rugby ball and I'm, I'm, I just start running for it. I just ran and people were coming at me and I was either dodging them or knocking them out the way. And I remember one lad ran up to me and I could see, I knew he was a good player. I knew he was gonna tackle me. I just put my hand out into his face and just like pushed him away as he came towards me. But I also remember my little finger I felt it like it was like squidgy. I basically put my finger in his mouth as I pushed him in the face and I was like, ew. <laughs> I didn't want to put my hand in his mouth. But I remember pushing him away and I just carried on running. It was just crazy. And my teacher was just like cheering me. Like he loved it. He thought it was amazing. But the lad came over to me. He was like, you know, you punched me in the face and you put your finger in my mouth and all this. And I was like, yeah, um, yeah, I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> But that's, that was one funny story that came to my mind. Um, I think another one would be, uh, again, at the same school, I think it was, uh, the headmaster decided, because because the pitch we were playing on was, it had been raining a lot, and we needed to practice playing cricket, because it was cricket season was coming, and we had some matches against other schools. And, uh, you know, I was on the cricket team. So our headmaster decided that, um, that we could play on the school playground. Uh, after school so you know the cricket team assembled on the school playground and normally when we play on the playground uh, we have like a, a softball um, just you know because obviously you don't want to be playing with a proper full cricket sort of corky ball which is like hard leather um, so we, we play with a softball but this time the teacher was like no 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 we need to practice properly we need to practice with a full like corky ball and we're saying well it's going to get damaged it's on the floor it's made out of concrete it's not grass you know it's going to get damaged but anyway he insisted that we play with this thing so we start playing with it well inevitably at some point one lad just smacks the ball it goes hurtling off towards the school and next thing there's just an enormous uh, shattering noise as this thing just punches through an enormous piece of glass like six by six piece of glass shatters glass into the corridor all over the floor of the playground and we're all like rolling around laughing you know and the teacher's like uh and the guy who hit the ball was like uh <laughs> i'm gonna have to go and see the headmaster now um and then after that the headmaster said right well, we're not playing cricket on the playground anymore but Again, it's just one of those things that sticks in your mind. So that that would be my they would be my kind of funny sports stories, I guess, uh, from my youth. Next question comes from Coded Gamer Twenty Two. He says, um, "If you could be in the Olympics, what sport would you play? Uh, do you play or have you played any sports which are already in the Olympics?" Not really. I don't think. Uh, I don't think snooker is in the Olympics. I can't remember if cricket is. Uh, football is, I believe. But in terms of what I would want to play, you see, if I was going to play a sport competitively, like in the Olympics, to try and win a medal, I would try and take advantage of, of my strengths, as it were. And I think, you know, my strengths lie in my upper body. I have upper body strength, basically. Um, and therefore, I would go for something like the discus, or the hammer throw or perhaps even the shot put but probably not the shot put I have fairly long arms I have a long back a uh, strong back and a big chest so I would go for like upper body stuff so like hurtling things and throwing things would be more what I would do uh, I certainly wouldn't go in for running or you know hurdles or any of that kind of nonsense I'll slow down so yeah I, I would probably go for something like the discus or the hammer throw 
Next question comes from Kansas Dude. He says, do you think billiards stroke pool is a sport? Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? So I had a quick look at the definition of a sport, just to sort of... Because I knew full well that if I didn't, somebody would. So the definition of, of a sport is this. An activity involving exer physical exertion and skill in which an individual or team competes against another or other for entertainment. And that, that last bit's interesting. For entertainment. So one person or team competes against others for entertainment and it involves physical exertion. That's the definition of a sport. Pretty interesting definition. One second. I think we'll pull out that. Blimey, it felt like we just drove over a curb or something in the middle of the road. You can wait for me, pal. You're merging in. Um, Alright, so let's take that definition and then apply it to something like billiards and pool. Well, in billiards and pool, or even, I'm guessing, snooker, you can obviously extend it to the same thing. It's a very similar thing. Um, does it involve physical exertion? Well, I suppose it depends where you draw the line. I mean, it involves... A fit, you know, you got to hold a cue, you got to walk on the table, knock some balls. You're not, you're not going to be out of breath or anything. But it's a, it's a physical thing. Is it a team? It's not a team, but it's definitely an individual competing for entertainment. So under that definition, it probably is a sport. Um, it's certainly the World Snooker Championships are pretty big. I mean, the prize money's pretty big. So I guess you could class it as a sport. I don't know about billiards. Billiards is not something that's played. I don't think competitively for entertainment uh, but pool definitely is pool's pretty big in the states as I understand it let's put some lights on um, but then you know let's have a look at some others that are similar I mean if we if we're saying that that you know pool and snooker uh, and billiards are not sports then we would also have to look at some other things for example darts and darts is another one of those that people say oh, it's not a sport is it well, again, it's competitive for entertainment. It involves some physical exertion, but not much. Where do you draw the line? I don't know. Um, golf. What about golf? It requires only a bit more physical exertion than snooker. I mean, at the end of the day, you've got your club. You give it a good swing, and then you put it back in the bag. And then you're just going for a stroll. I mean, are we going to declassify that as a sport? So, I mean, it, it is a bit of a weird one, but I would, I would suggest that they're all sports. I mean, they're all done for entertainment, ultimately. They're competitive and done for entertainment, so I would class them as sports. And more interestingly is when you come to um, eSports, yeah? What about eSports? So playing Counter-Strike, a team of five people competing against another team of five people for the purposes of entertainment, and they call it an eSport, right? So they're already classifying it as a sport that has less physical exertion than a game of darts. All you've got to do is move a mouse and touch a keyboard. So if you're going to declassify these games, you're going to have to take the whole esports movement out of the equation as well. So yeah, there you go. I'm fine with it being a sport. I'm fine with all of these things being a sport. That's how I see it anyway. Uh, right, next question comes from... Uh, so who was that? Was That was from... Uh, one second. Lights. That was from Kansas, dude, wasn't it? Oh, slow down. Um, let's think. Dallas. I think I missed a question out in my list, actually. Yes, I did. Yeah, next question is from Dallas. He says, what are your thoughts on American football? My thoughts on American football. In the 90s, I used to watch quite a lot of American football. It was on Channel 4, which is like a TV channel in, in the UK. They kind of brought it over, and they were the only channel that showed it back then. And I got into it. I learned the rules. I, I learned how it all worked. I used to stay up watching the Super Bowl. I think when John Madden's, uh, John Madden's game came out on the... I think it was the Mega Drive it came out when I played it. I used to play it quite a lot with my friend. And I really enjoyed it. And then I just after a few years, I just got bored of it. I think because I couldn't go and watch a proper game, I guess. 
I see it on TV. I see these massive stadiums, and I think to myself, you know, one day I'd like to just go to a, a match, um, an American football game, just to see, you just, just experience it. Um, but other than that, I, I don't really have much, um, I don't really watch American football anymore, let me put it that way. So the next question comes from Coded, uh, Coded Gamer 22 what football team in the UK do you or would you support? So, let's get some quick air here. Um, I don't, ultimately. I, I don't support a football team. I've never even paid to go and watch a football match. Uh, and I think the definition of a fan or a supporter is somebody that, you know, watches a team play, uh, goes to a match, you know, buys the, the jersey, like whatever they can to help the team. I don't, I don't do any of those things. I don't, I don't even watch football. Like, the only football I ever watch is um oh this is gonna be cool the only football i ever watch is like the world cup you know like a country level or in the european cup i don't watch any local games at all wow look at the win look at the windows look at the blatant pictures <laughs> still at least the train is of a reasonable length that's fun. That was good timing. Uh, so I don't, I don't support a football team. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Kansas dude. Actually, Kansas dude leading on from his billiards and sport and pool question says, "Do you think gaming, like pro gaming tournaments, is a sport?" Pro gaming tournaments. Well, again, esports. Um, you know, basically, esports is doesn't require physical exertion. So. You know, if they're classed as a sport, then you have to class all these other things as a sport. I think you need to ignore the physical exertion part of it to some extent and focus on the last bit where it says, you know, a team or an individual competing for entertainment. I think that is what makes it a sport. It's all about if it's if it's entertaining to watch, if it's entertaining to watch people compete, it is a sport, I think. You know, whether it's on a computer or whether it's, you know, people throwing each other around a ring. Uh, or kicking a ball down the field. Whatever it is, it's still a sport. That would be my definition of it. I like these flashing arrows here. They're pretty cool. That's not something I've seen very often. I should do more of that. <clears throat> okay, next question is from Pat R. He says, do you wish to see Olympics being held in London again? <laughs> so the Olympics were held in... Was it 2012, I think it was? Uh, in London. Now... I don't think we'll see the Olympics back in uh, the UK in my lifetime. I, I just can't see it happening. It has to be fairly rotated around the world. I don't think it will come back here. I think the UK did a very good job. Uh, surprised a lot of people, actually. A lot of countries were surprised by like how well the UK did it. They did it on time. Uh, they put on a really good show. It was really friendly. It was safe. It went very, very well. And, uh, and I think that surprised a lot of people. Now, it just so happens that I used to commute into London on the train um, right past the... right through Stratford, which is where the London Olympics were. And I saw that land before they even started building here. I watched the Olympics being built there. I watched the buildings, the stadiums go up, uh, the swimming pool, the, you know, the, the Pringle Basin, everything. I saw it all being done. I saw it all completed, I went through on the train when it was on, the actual Olympics were on, and then afterwards I watched it all being tore down piece by piece. I saw the whole birth and death of the Olympics in London, every day as I went past it on a train. And yet, I could not get a single ticket to the Olympics, despite being a British citizen, and, a, and despite ordering 600 pounds worth of tickets for the Olympics in various events, I did not get allocated a single ticket. Why? Because the booking system for the tickets in the UK, if you were if you were a resident of the UK, the booking system was a joke. It was an absolute joke and it was unfair. And I couldn't get a single ticket for anybody in my family. My daughter really wanted to go and watch like the um, uh, the horses, like the what do they call it? The um, can't think of the word. Where they sort of 
dressage. You know, she really wanted to go and watch all that. I tried to get tickets, couldn't get any. It was really sad. And I'm not going to lie, I was a bit salty about it. You know? I, I lived 30 minutes outside of London, born in England, couldn't get a ticket for the Olympics in a lifetime opportunity. And yet, I was working with people, I was working with contractors from India, and they got loads of tickets. How? They went on their website in India and managed to book loads of tickets, no problem at all. They went to all, to all these different events and I couldn't go to a single one. And, I, and I, I live in this country, this is in my country, and I cannot get tickets. How does that work? I don't know. So I missed it. I missed seeing any part of the Olympics. I didn't get to go to any of it. Would I like to see it back here again? It doesn't matter. It's not going to happen anyway. But in essence, no, not really. I think if I want to see the Olympics, I'll just go and watch them in another country. Like, I'll just wait till the, the Olympics are held, you know, maybe in a different European country and go and watch it there. And hopefully I can get some tickets. So no, I don't really, <laughs> but I want to see the Olympics in London again, and I don't think they ever will be for a long time. Scary92 says, um, Do you believe that sport can create peace in the world, such as during World War II? <sighs> Do you think that a sport can create peace in the world, such as during World War II? Well, I don't remember sport creating peace as such during World War II, uh, I think there were certain acts of sport and peacefulness that happened, but it didn't create any peace, not that I remember anyway, unless you're referring to something specific. But the answer, my answer would be no. I think sport, you know, sport is about competition. It's about entertainment and competition. That's what it's about. I don't really think it has anything to do with politics, and I don't think it ever should have anything to do with politics. It should be above all of that. There should be no political element in sporting. That's not to say there isn't. I'm saying there shouldn't be. But interesting thing is by its very nature, sport is competitive. Which means you're always going to have winners, you're always going to have losers. And the losers are never very happy about it. You know, people, people shake hands at the end of a game but the winners going away feeling really chuffed and the losers are going away feeling a bit annoyed and sad. To me, your proposition about sport creating world peace is not really, it doesn't, it doesn't compute in my head because there's always going to be somebody in, in the competition that's annoyed because they lost or perhaps they thought there was cheating or perhaps they accused the referee of cheating or blah blah blah, all these are the reasons that people argue when there's a sport on. There's always fights in sports. People get angry. You know, flares, uh, tempers flare. I can't really see how that is conducive to, to peace, in all honesty. And we've all encountered sore losers, and we've all seen sore losers, so I'm not really sure how it even works. But in any event, I don't think, I, I think that sport is sport, and, and politics are politics. And I think they always should be kept separately like that. That's that's my view on it. You know, wars are between countries and sport should just sit above all of that. that that's my personal view. Dan says, did you ever collect sports cards? Um, no, I don't think I did. I, did. I didn't collect sports cards, Dan. I did collect uh, football stickers. They were like stickers of players and you would stick them into a book. So I think the book was called, it was like an annual that came out and it, I think it was Figurine Panini or something. And, and you, what you'd do is you'd, you'd buy these packets at the shop. And I think you used to get like bubble gum with them or something weird like that. You buy these packets and they'd have like five cards in them, random five cards or five stickers. And uh, if you already, you know, sometimes you get like the rare ones and if you had the common ones, you would trade them. You would trade them with other people uh, in the playground to try and fill up your book but inevitably I think once you got down to 50 or less in your book if you had 50 or less what you could do is you could write off to them with the 50 that you wanted and pay for them and one year I did that I managed to fill my book completely in one year it was I only did it once 
Um, but it, it was the thing to do at school. Like, this is what people were doing. They were all walking around trading these stickers. So if you bought a pack and it had, like, a really rare thing in it that, some, that everybody wanted in school, you could just, like, oh, man, you could just trade with different people. Well, he's offering me this, 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 and this. What are you offering, you know? And it was good fun. But it was completely pointless at the end. I don't even think anybody's got these books anymore. I think I may have, I may have a book in my attic. I may have from my childhood. Don't know what conditions it, it is in if I've got it, but I, I may still have it. Right, one second. Let's negotiate this corner. How far have we got left? 175. We should make it by the morning, no problem. Does the lane merge? No, apparently not. Okay, well, we're on the highway. Let's get the speed up a little bit. 80k limit. Looking good. Um, next question is from that scared guy. He says... Uh, would you class WWE as a sport or entertainment? Uh, so WWE, I think he's referring to the wrestling, which I think used to be called WWF, but they lost a, a lawsuit with the... Um, hang on a second, is this the lane we want? No, this is the lane we want. WWE used to be WWF, I think, but they lost a, a lawsuit with the worldwide... World Wildlife Fund, I think it was, who had the letters WWF, so they had to call himself WWE. Anyway, that aside, I think he's on about the wrestling. So what he's saying is, would you class it as a sport or as entertainment? <laughs> I think everybody has a different view on this, probably. Well, it certainly contains physical exertion, I would say. Wrestling contains physical exertion. I don't think anybody would argue about that one. I think... If you believe that WWE, if you believe that it's competitive, if what you're seeing is competitive, like it's it's two guys or whatever, and they're going at it competitively to try and win, then that's a sport. You would you would see it as a sport. If you believe that what you're seeing is scripted and that the winner has already been predetermined then I would class it as entertainment. Now, I don't really watch WWE, so I don't know, you know, I don't, I honestly don't know whether it's uh, scripted, whether it's all predetermined, or whether it is genuinely competitive. I, d I honestly don't know. But I'm just saying, if whatever, whatever you believe, if you think it is competitive, then it would be a sport, and if you think it's all scripted, um, then it's definitely entertainment. So I think you need to make your own mind up, because I, I don't watch enough of it to make an argument. Next question comes from uh, Halvard Moberg. I think that's how we say your name. What are your thoughts on athletics using steroids and drugs to better their performance? <laughs> what are your thoughts on athletics using steroids and drugs to better their performance? Hmm. Well, the rules of competition as I understand them, uh, they they have substances that are banned, yeah? They have a list of performance-enhancing drugs that are banned. That's what they that's what they say. Do we need to get off of this lane here? I think it's lying to us. I think we can go straight on. It's one of those quirky things where it tries to make... Yeah, there you go. Um, they, they always publish a list of banned substances, and there's always, like, weird crossovers where somebody's taking something for medical reasons um, but it's showing up as a banned substance there's always those little things but they <clears throat> they have to have a list of, of substances that are banned because if they don't then all the co all, everybody competing will take varying doses of drugs in order to win they'll use performance enhancing drugs it's it's a given but even when there's a list of banned substances some of the competitors will still deem it worthy of risking it to use performance enhancing drugs on banned substances. They'll always do it because it's a competition and they want to win. You're never going to change that, I don't think. 
Um, if you get caught taking these drugs, you pay the price. But I don't think that you will ever stop the human desire to compete. And I don't think you'll ever stop the human desire to win. And I don't think you'll ever stop the human desire to, to cheat doing it. There's always going to be people who are quite happy to cheat in order to win. Like for me, from my own perspective, if I was to compete and I cheated, whatever winning I got, whatever medal I was given, whatever a trophy or award or money I was given, I would not take any personal satisfaction from that. I would feel like a fraud. I would feel like a charlatan. I, I, I wouldn't feel like I've earned it. I, even if everybody believed I'd earn it, deep down I would know I did not win that fairly. You know, I used a drug or I used something that was not allowed, I got away with it, but I won anyway. But that's, not everybody's like that. A lot of people are quite happy to take a win in any way they can get it. And that applies to, you know, online gaming. There are, there are lots of people that cheat when they can, then they're quite happy doing it. They, they're quite happy to win that way. So, you know, at the end of the day, all you can do is put your rules in place, put the bannable substances list up, and then try and catch the people who try to break the rules. And you know, only re you know, not many years ago we've seen people winning and then had the medals stripped of them because they were found to have a banned substance in their body. It happens, it always will, it's never going to stop. So from a personal perspective I would never do it, I would never compete that way, but I don't think you'll ever stop it from happening. So it's just one of those things, like trolls on the internet, we're going to have to just put up with them. <laughs> That's my view on it. Let's put that on a bit so we can see where we're going. Uh, next question from Luke, he says, have you ever played golf? Yeah, absolutely. When I was a teenager, I used to play a lot of golf, actually. I used to practice every day. I would go down to the field with a couple of clubs, uh, and I would, I would basically... It started off as me and a friend, we just... I think we found a club in his garage. We just found, like, one club in his garage, and we went down to the field, got a couple of balls, and just started... We just shared the club and just knocked the ball from tree to tree, like about 50, 80 yards or something. And that's how it started. Next thing, you know, we went and bought another club each, and then we started to think, well, what would it be like to go and play on a golf course, and what are the rules, and all this kind of thing. And we really got into it. I, I went, I spent a lot of money on uh, golf, you know, playing in different courses, uh, buying decent equipment, you know, shoes, all the rest of it. Um, really got into it. Even when I, even um, in my 20s, I was a player that, um, I was quite a good player, actually. I think the I ever the most I ever got down to was about four handicap. But that was at my absolute peak. I, I used to play normally for about nine or ten or something. But I was a good player, and then I started to get back problems uh, later in life, and it, may, it it affected my swing. So I, you know, even now I know what my swing used to be. I know what my swing should be. I know what I should do, but I can't make it happen. I can't bend my back as much as I used to. But I used to have a pretty good swing and a very powerful shot. Uh, putting was always, if you like, my weak spot. Um, but as my brother used to say to me, um, you know, I, I was very good as a driving, I was very good mid-game, but when it came to putting, I wasn't so brilliant. And he said to me, well, you drive for show and you put for dough. And that was true. You really do. It doesn't. You can get on the green in like two shots, but if you spend another two or three putting it in the hole, you're never going to win anything. Uh, and that was very much my weakness. Uh, some people just have a knack for it. They can just predict how to hit the ball. It's it's amazing. I don't know how they do it. Um, but yeah, golf was something I used to play a lot of. Uh, question from Mark says, Hello Squirrel, love the series. How good or bad at sport were you at school? And if you have another chance in life, do you think you would have taken up a sport? And if so, which one? Blimey, long question. Um, I was an all-rounder. I wasn't particularly brilliant at any one sport. I was a very good all-rounder. Um, but I didn't excel in anything. You know, in football, I was a very good goalkeeper, actually. I was one of the best goalkeepers in the school. But, in terms of a national sense, probably not that great. But I was a good goalkeeper. In cricket, I was an all-rounder again. I was like Ian Botham, really. I was a... a fast bowler. Are we gonna open? 
Blimey, how close do you want it? There we go. Uh, I was a fast bowler. I was a good hitter. Uh, I could catch the ball well. Snooker and golf. You know, I played those outside of school. But it was more about enjoyment. The thing is about sport for me was I never, and this is going to sound weird, I never really tried to compete against other people that much. I was always competing against myself. I was always trying to... For me, the interest lay in trying to master whatever it was I was trying to do. So in golf, I would always try to master my swing and, and attain the perfect swing. In snooker, I was always trying to master my grip, master my arm position, master cue, my cueing action. I was always trying to master those things. Um, in football, I was just trying to be the best goalie I could be. But I didn't see myself as directly competing against other people. Even though I was, and it was a sport, so I was supposed to be, really I was trying to compete against myself. Which kind of sounds a bit odd, but that's that's my approach to it. It was all about self-improvement, really. Let's try and line this up. It's looking good. Bring it up, and bingo bango. There we go. Welcome to Berlin. Let's see how much money we've got. Excellent. 600 kilometers driven. 28 grand. 957 XP. Takes us halfway through level 68. That's not bad. Let's uh, pull forward a second. Okay, we've got time for one very... I had one last question, so I'm going to quickly ask it. Uh, it was from Kenshaw1. He says, Hello, Paul, in motor racing, what would be your most favourite truck uh, racetrack to race on if you had the chance? Again, I had to think about this one, uh, Kenshaw. My most favourite racetrack. Monaco. I think the Monaco racetrack in Formula 1 is unique in the world. And I've actually driven... When I went to Monaco, I hired a car and I drove the track. And let me tell you, you drive down there and then you think to yourself, there are people racing Formula One cars down this. That's insane. And it is. It's insane. But in terms of my absolute favourite, w w without a shadow of a doubt in my mind, it would be uh, the Belgium Formula One Grand Prix at spa Francorchamps. By far, my favourite track ever. I used to race... I, I've, I've driven around it countless times in, in simulators. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, I used to play games like Jeff Crammon's uh, Formula 1, or I think it was called Jeff Crammon's Grand Prix back then. Um, used to play that, and that's where I really first got my love of it. Used to watch Formula 1 on the TV, like, religiously. Um, you know, the whole Nigel Mansell, Schumacher, Senna era was, was massive for me. And that's where I loved, I learned to love, as a circuit, Spa-Francorchamps was just one of the best. I'll drop a link in the video description not only to ask questions for next week, sorry, next episode of TMCN, but I'll also drop you a bonus link in there, which takes you to another YouTube video where you can go and look at what Jeff Crammon's Grand Prix was like around Spa Francorchamps. And if you think that that was back in like 1994, and you look at the graphics, it's not bad. Let me say that. That's it for this week's uh, TMCN. I hope you enjoyed that one. Please give me a thumbs up if you did. Until next time, guys, take care. Happy trucking.